The moment's arrived when 25,000 official delegates from 195 countries converge on Paris for the climate conference officially titled COP21. COP stands for Conference of Parties, and this 21st annual meeting is widely considered the big one. And it's going forward, world leaders arriving in mass despite the terrorist attacks that struck Paris just over two weeks ago. What a powerful rebuke to the terrorists it will be. Why is COP21 considered to be so significant? Many world leaders are suggesting that this could be the best chance yet to reach a global agreement that tackles climate change. Negotiators hope their efforts over the next two weeks will steer the planet away from what many here believe could be the catastrophic consequences of inaction. In some countries, the U.S., for example, many politicians question whether the costs of the proposed cures for climate change carbon emission regulations are creating havoc are worse than the disease. But here at COP21, negotiating teams are operating from clearly defined assumptions. What are their assumptions? Assumption one, that climate change becomes unacceptably dangerous to humankind if the average global temperature rises more than two degrees Celsius. Two, that the way to stay below the two degree benchmark is to keep humankind's total tally of carbon dioxide emitted into the atmosphere since the dawn of the industrial revolution below one trillion tons. This figure is often referred to as the carbon budget. Three, that most of the carbon budget has already been spent and now the roughly one quarter of it that remains must somehow be divided between countries in a collectively agreed upon way. Do negotiators hope to divide what remains of the carbon budget here in Paris? Ideally, yes, but here's the problem. Leading up to the conference, more than 180 countries submitted pledges for how much they would limit their CO2 emissions over coming decades. The UN did the math and determined that those pledges, if carried out, still leave global warming rising three degrees. It's positive that so many countries have made commitments. We now have a baseline, if you like. The commitments are not enough. The disparity between what the UN says is required and what countries are putting on the table is often referred to as the gap. So how will negotiators try to close the gap? Closing it's widely considered, at least here in Paris, unrealistic. But many officials hope countries will agree to a five-year review on targets to later ramp up ambition on cutting emissions. Their hope is that countries will, in coming years, have greater appreciation for the severity of the issue and be willing to contribute more. New technologies will come online and make the task of cutting carbon easier and less costly. What are the friction points in these negotiations? The trickiest issues to negotiate relate to how responsibility for reducing CO2 emissions is divided. On one side are so-called developed countries like the US and the European states. Most of them have stabilized or even reduced already their CO2 emissions. On the other side are fast-growing developing countries like China, India, and the African states. Their CO2 emissions levels are rising, in some cases dramatically. And these developing countries have adopted a premise of their own that the more wealthy developed countries, which already used up way more of their fair share of the planet's carbon budget, should help pay the high cost of shifting to non-carbon fuel sources. That way, these developing economies can continue to grow and an even larger share of their booming populations can enjoy the higher quality of life that energy brings. COP21's stated aim is to combat climate change. The nitty gritty of negotiations could mostly be about the worldly concern of money. That's the short answer.